Good evening everyone. I am Pradeep Kumar Sarangapani. I am the, I'm currently as the Quality and the Standardization Manager for Airbus Group India Private Limited. Thanks to NPTEL, the National Program on Technical Enhanced Learning, for giving me an opportunity to share my experience and views on the subject. So, um, my agenda would be, I would start just to give you a brief introduction about me and then we will move on to the subject. So, um, just to introduce myself. So, um, I have, you, if you see on your left screen, left side of the screen, you, 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 mu you must be seeing, wondering about those numbers on the top. 86, 14, and 34. There are some magic numbers, um, some magic numbers on uh, of my life. I started my aviation career in 1986, and then the second one is 14 years with Airbus, with uh, a very vast experience as instructor, assessor, standards, quality. So that's about with Airbus, and then you have uh, 34, which is the number of years of experience I have on my in my aviation uh, career. So just to go from the right to left, starting with military aviation, helicopters, aircrafts, in all uh, uh, models, I would say, Russian, British, French, and then modifications, modifications in uh, in uh, VIP aircrafts and so on. And then commercial aviation, commercial aviation uh, for 14 years. And then, uh, as I told you, the magic number 34 comes from my three decades of aviation experience. I have been an instructor, an assessor, that is for practical exercises and so on, for maintenance. I then moved to standardization, which, are, which is a very important role. And then quality, because that's a natural trend. Uh, transition from being an instructor, knowing the subject, assessor, then standards, then quality, then subsequently auditor. Then you have also innovation and development. I have been working on several innovation projects for Airbus and development of uh, skill packages or courseware. And then last but not the least, I am also a certified drone pilot. Drones being the latest buzz in uh, aviation industry. So those are the magic numbers, 86, 14 and 34 for me. And let's move on to the subject. Uh, the today's subject is about avionics. Right? So avionics and uh, subsequently it's future of flying. When I say future of flying, flying is a very, very vast area, vast subject to talk about. Flying can be anything flying in air. That could be aircrafts. Today's world, the drones, which is the latest bus. It could be satellites. It could be anything which is flying, basically, except for the birds, of course. Now, we, are, we will talk about a little about the future in the last, because future is not something which we can predict so well. We can, let's say, uh, plan for the future, but not really everything goes uh, perfectly as for the plan all, all the time. We can prepare for the future. So we will have most often talking about avionics and drones. Then we will move to future of avionics, future of drones. And then I will, uh, let's say, at the end of the session, we will uh, pick up some questions from the audience. Now, um, what is avionics? The word uh, avionics comes from a, from a combination of avia, that means flight, and electronics. It comes from you know the first four liters and the last four liters. Put, putting together, it's, it becomes avionics, or let's call it as electronics as applied to aviation. And uh, 
don't look at the the picture this is a very strange picture you won't see uh, an aircraft like this uh, without the cockpit uh, actually now what is that we are going to cover or what is that we are going to discuss and the focus of uh, today's discussion is going to be aircraft avionics avionics can be from aircraft avionics satellite avionics uav avionics uav stands for unmanned aerial vehicles but uav avionics itself is a very huge subject we can talk about uavs which are for military for commercial purposes as well so our focus would be initially aircraft based avionics but then i would also walk into some uh, part of uav avionics now when we talk about aircraft avionics in general there are three segregations uh, which i would like to talk about cockpit automation then talking about airborne separation assurance system which could be uh, landing systems which could be navigation which could be uh, uh, traffic co collision avoidance systems and so on and then flight management systems by the name itself it says flight management system so how we manage the flight and then broadly another category called navigation systems so we navigate ourselves through the flight from the origin to the destination so what do we use in navigation to fly from one point a to point b is inertia inertial systems that means we use some uh, systems some components which would allow us to understand where we are satellite based guidance that means we are using satellites geostationary satellites and we use their reference to identify where we are then digital altitude controls altitude from from our let's say barometric altitude or from the ground then landing systems vision systems that means how we look at uh, outside and radar systems radar systems are basically primarily to identify weather but not just weather it could be weather in terms of precipitation it could also be the weather in terms of turbulence so avionics center when you talk about avionics center it's always the cockpit the computers are, might be placed in the cargo compartment of an aeroplane of a, of an aircraft it could be placed in a avionic compartment it could be placed anywhere in, in, inside the aircraft but the center of activity is always the cockpit avionic center we call it because where we control from where we get the interface to where we look at the sensors giving the inputs all that is in the cockpit now i would like to draw your attention on those displays lovely looking displays in the, in the uh, cockpit which is in front of the pilots normally the the left hand seat which you see on your left screen here this is your captain seat conventionally we call it as uh, always the captain seat and the right hand seat is called the first officer seat these seats accommodate or allow the pilots to more or less place centrally towards the display units which will give you two different systems what are those two different systems we call it as ecam that's electronic centralized aircraft monitoring system and efis electric electronic flight instrument system by the name itself it says centralized monitoring system that means it is in the center monitoring all the systems of the airplane of the aircraft the second one is electronic flight instrument systems that means it is giving you the flight instruments what are the flight parameters the speed of the aircraft where we are flying to or where we are flying from altitude could be barometric could be radio the flight path the flight angle that's very important so all these are you can see these two on the right hand side you you can actually see those display units these two are called the electric electronic flight instrument systems and the one in the middle are 
the aircraft systems. So, avionics center basically is the cockpit itself, where we have controls. Which, when I say controls, it's for the controls of the of the uh, systems, which are normally on the overhead or the central control pedestal, or could be also your side six sticks. Side sticks are normally the Airbus philosophy. And what you see here on the right hand side picture, these are the control columns. These are basically the Boeing philosophy. So I have just taken two snapshots of Airbus and Boeing. Normally the major commercial market is focused on duopoly of Airbus and Boeing uh, philosophies or Airbus and Boeing uh, manufactured aircrafts. Now let's look move from avionics center to how we perceive, how we get this information from, what are those things which help externally to get gather information for our avionics. There are some, uh, not some, a few sensors, proximity detectors, could be thermal sensors, could be infrared sensors. These sensors are within the aircraft integral, but there are some antennas which are external to the aircraft when you walk into to the airport next time uh, stop taking a selfie and look at those aircrafts they have some points which are clearly protruding than the others these are sensors or antennas i would say these antennas are giving us information which are coming from external sources could be from the ground ground radars ground transponders could also be reverse that means the aircraft is transmitting its data through these antennas externally so i've just picked up two of those lovely aircrafts the boeing 787 and a airbus 320 these are sensors we would talk a few of them these systems when in the coming slides or coming uh, presentation i would just like to pick one or two of them one is the ATC, air traffic control. We have plenty of aircrafts now with the air, uh, aviation industry booming. You have plenty of aircrafts. It's not as packed as a Delhi traffic or a Bangalore traffic, but then you still have a lot of traffic because all these aircrafts converge or diverge depending on takeoff or landing situations from an airport. So you have a lot of traffic. So the air traffic transponders air traffic control transponders where you can see the antennas here as well as here these antennas are transmitting data as well as receiving information from the ground this system is called as IFF identification of friend or foe in military terms in the civil aviation we call it as ATC transponders they send a coded message to the ground to identify what is this aircraft, what is the type, where it is flying to, what is its call sign. Call sign is kind of a name for every aircraft on a particular flight path. So this data is transmitted. So it is an identification of the aircraft flying in a particular path on a particular date. Now, looking at another one, we also have another antenna called TCAS. This TCAS antenna, TCAS stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System. So again, it's something, it's preventive measure between two aircrafts when they are flying more or less on the same flight path, opposite each other, or could be flying into their flight path. Traffic collision avoidance system so it's like a preventive measure we can also see some communications channels VHF and HF VHF stands for very high frequency HF stands for high frequency high frequency is used for long distance communication very uh, high frequency is for short to medium distance communication we will also see some part of radio altimeter by the name itself it says radio that means it's transmitting radio signals altimeter so it's calculating altitude but the difference is 
we have two different altitude parameters on the uh, on the aircraft one is a barometric altitude that means it is the reference value is mean sea level the other one is radio height height is from ground or water or whatever is the ground surface to the aircraft so the radio altimeters are used for the radio height from the ground to the aircraft normally used during takeoff and landing but not necessarily only that so these are antennas external to the aircraft they transmit or receive from the ground now when we talk about avionic system in general we have plenty of them really plenty of them and uh, an hour and a half of uh, web webinar which we are doing today I don't think it's enough to talk about all these systems nevertheless I would like to capture a few of them and next time when you travel in an aircraft you will feel very safe these avionic systems are really really making the aircraft very redundant very safe in flight and they have preventive as well as corrective measures and these give interfaces they give information to the pilots to help them in easy safe and very very uh, redundant flying so what are those things which we have cockpit systems and display yes we talked about navigation auto landing we will see that in the next coming slides warning systems when i say i said first preventive but then i also mentioned corrective corrective could be when a system fails don't worry if a system fails doesn't mean that you have lost something it actually means there are two systems always one system fails the other one immediately takes over so avionics systems are based on redundancy and reliability so nothing is lost if you have one system lost really nothing so you don't really worry too much when you are flying the pilots are there to take care of that then we have on board systems which are to take care flight management for example sensors integration we will see in the, in the coming slides we we also look at accelerometers gyros etc we have flight data recording in case of an incident or an unlikely accident you must have heard the famous name called black boxes we had a unfortunate event a few days back a couple of days back so we have the flight data recorder which is the black box being taken away for investigation and and then so on and so forth so you have a lot of them also which we are going to look at at the later point of time is smart maintenance we will also look at aircraft health and usage monitoring systems okay now, we are just going to classify this aircraft avionics into three major parts cockpit automation why do we need cockpit automation is for primarily pilot viewing pro for preventive and corrective actions then we go to the second one which is navigation and airborne separation again it's preventive airborne situation awareness that means if you have a tca situation you have an identification and so on and so forth air traffic in trail landing that means landing then we have traffic management and collision avoidance system so navigation is all that then the third part is planning if you have to fly from let's say delhi to bangalore if the pilot is going to fly on visual references you can imagine three hours of continuous work and it's complete fatigue and this guy he cannot fly the further sectors let's say you have a complete day and if you see major airlines in the world fly somewhere around 5 to 6 sectors in a day 24 hours 6 sectors minimum so if he has to fly visual that means he has to take visual reference from 30000 feet downwards it will take for him 3 hours to watch every single visual reference and it's going to be a very tough job so we have flight management systems which will assist him so flight database inertial navigation systems to identify where you are exactly then we will see low visibility approach landing and so on so these are the three major topics we would talk about today for aircraft avionics 
Now cockpit automation, I talked about, about this. You can see a lot of information on this. Really a lot of information on these screens. You can see the weather radar. So black is good, green is good, yellow is caution, red danger. That means you, you, can, you should not fly into that red area. You have the flight information where you have speed, altitude, attitude, all that. Navigation, you can see all that here as well. You can see your position, where you are. So you have plenty of information for the pilot to decide, to monitor, to, to have an overview of what's happening with the aircraft, how he is flying. You also have all the engine parameters, that means he knows. So you can also see it here, engine parameters. He can also see the system parameters which are here. So that means he has a complete overview of the aircraft. There are two pilots. They have an area of scope of activity. That means their the attention is divided. One flies, one monitors. So it's really, really nice to share your workload. You have all the things covered up. Now, navigation. Now, when we looked at the the place of center of activity, that's the cockpit. You also have the navigation part where we are going to look at the ADIRS, that means Air Data Inertial Reference System, GPS. Plenty of us will know what is a GPS, Global Positioning System. Then you have standby instruments. Basically, they, these are standby instruments, that means if for an unlikely event of the main instrument's failure, we still have something called a standby instrument to take care of, and these are completely standalone. So they don't have any dependency on the main system. So if you have lost the main system, there's no problem. We still have a standby system which is standalone. Okay. Then we have radio navigation, radio altimeter, and so on. Additional systems, ground proximity warning system, air traffic control, weather radar and so on. So we will see some of them for sure. Okay. Now let's look at the first one, airborne separation. I put a few of them, radio navigation performance, we saw radio navigation, we have horizontal and vertical separation. It looks very close, isn't it? But actually it's not. A 380 followed by a 320, an Airbus 380 followed by a 320, they are flying in the same direction but not uh, flying in the same altitude. But then because of the size, when you are looking from downwards, it looks as if they are flying one behind the another. It's a parallax, it's an uh, optical illusion, I would say. So this is the vertical separation we, are, we would be looking at. We would also look at identification the transponders, the TCAS, positioning, it's going to be GPS, and something like weather, forecasting, okay? So these are something which we will look into the coming uh, slides. We will also look at situational awareness. Situational awareness, something very strange is when you are flying in air, as I told you before, the, the the airspace is getting narrowed and narrowed because the number of aircrafts flying in airspace is increasing a lot. So the situational awareness is extremely important, not just only for the aircraft and the pilot himself or themselves. It is also equally important for the air traffic controller on the ground. Because if they are not really aware who is flying where, it will lead to a lot of incidents, accidents. That's one. It will lead to a lot of delays. So situational awareness is extremely important to manage the traffic. Now then we have the ADS-B, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. This is broadcasted continuously without any manual intervention. That means pilot has enough jobs to do during the flight. So the pilot is does not require the pilot's action to identify itself. The aircraft is having a transponder system which would transmit whenever it is interrogated, 
or periodical or both. Then we have TCAS, we have GPWS, Ground Proximity Warning System. That actually means it's closer, proximity, that means it is closer to ground. So it's it warns when the aircraft is closer to ground. It also warns when the aircraft suddenly loses its altitude, that means the aircraft is taken off and then it loses altitude. Even then there is a system which will alert the pilot that you are losing altitude so that he can take a corrective action. And then we have ground and air system integration. We have a system called ACARS or ATIMS, Air Traffic Information Management System. So this system is sending and receiving information even when the aircraft is flying, even when aircraft is airborne. And then finally the traffic management primarily not only for commercial planes across any aircraft or any flying object. Now first let's look at the GPS story. We all know GPS is global positioning system. It was first by the Amer American Army which was 32 satellites giving beaming their own references something like this they are uh, sending their own references geostationary orbits covering the complete globe except a certain amount of uh, space on the north of the globe and south of the globe that means actually in other words the GPS is not effective 70 degrees and upwards on the north and 60 degrees downwards on the south. That means Antarctic and the Arctic regions are not fully covered because of the tilt of the globe. Except for that, the GPS is covering almost every single place which you can imagine of. Now, that started with the American satellites, the GPS, but it's not only the GPS in the sky now. We have the GLONASS, we have the Baidu, we have the Gagan, Gagan from India. So we have plenty of satellites which are now looking at, at the earth, giving their references. Mind you, it's giving its own reference and our receivers. That means could be your mobile, could be your GPS um, system on the car, on an aircraft, on a ship, anywhere. This receiver takes these references as a value calculates calibrates its own position according to the GPS position so we require a minimum of four satellites to be captured now all of you might have seen some days when you are using your GPS inside your homes you are not able to uh, identify your positions on Ola and Uber which also use GPS why is it so it's because the GPS satellites, the position of the GPS satellites are not well captured if it's inside a hangar or inside a building because these GPS reference signals are getting reflected back, reflected back on a very sound environment. So when we are outside, we need a minimum of four satellites, minimum of four satellites because we have this four satellites three satellites covering up three dimensions and the fourth satellite giving us the time reference because stationary object is fine but what happens to an object which keeps moving continuously so we need the time reference we need x y and z axis so we have three satellites three plus one four four satellites are required for our gps positioning with regards to our position calculation. Now, the GPS does not give you a very, very accurate data with regards to your altitude. Altitude is not so accurate. So, what is our method? Now, we are using the GPS system, ground-based augmentation system. You can see on your screen on the right-hand side, we have several sensors which are ground-based, 
which also take their inputs from the GPS but not only calculate the GPS positioning from these but they also beam it across and the aircrafts take inputs from the GPS system it also takes inputs from the GBAS that means ground based augmentation system it also takes it now with the Gagan from India we are also going to we have a few satellites up there in the geostationary orbits now we are enhancing our Gagan system and our Indian airports and Indian uh, air aviation sectors the transportation with the Gagan with the help of the GBAS system which will use information from the satellites but enhance our augmenting system with, with our ground based transmitters as well so you can see the uplink station reference stations which are taking the inputs from the satellites and also beam it back to the airplanes to the aircrafts for more precision uh, positioning by that what is that we are doing is basically improving operational efficiency that means reduce time perfect positioning perfect accurate positioning safety that's very very important for us because the the space is getting more and more crowded with more and more aircrafts and aviation based uh, vehicles environmental impact that means we are not really burning more fuel we are able to position ourselves perfectly good and then finally increases the airspace capacity by reducing infrastructure so it's both complementing each other so that's the GPS story and the enhanced GPS story we started with the GPS now it's the enhanced GPS story the next one which is on the aircraft is the the, the way we calculate our position not just depending on the GPS alone we are also able to calculate our position by ourselves that means aircraft based computer uh, computers the first one is what we call as the gyros these are basically the traditional gyros and the accelerometers installed on the air aircrafts these are basically piezo electric ones could be modern ones the aircraft axis whichever side it moves you have a balance weight it's traditional uh, equipment and this is captured by the rotation rate and the speed that means rotation rate plus the uh, angular velocity both picked up together and then calculating where it is moving how it is moving how quick it is moving but then we have now moved into much more advanced systems for the last 10 15 years now and these systems are ring laser gyros completely extremely accurate systems and i just put the systems there are two different uh, laser light emitting uh, devices and when at rest they would reach the same uh, path in the same fixed time but as the aircraft moves in the path of rotation the frequency difference will be captured by the system and will be able to create a fringe pattern you can see the difference of the time sequence here between this the top figure and the bottom figure this one is picked up by the the computer calculating and giving you the attitude of the aircraft and the vertical uh, attitudes the verti uh, vertical speed this is the system which we are using and this one is part of the ADIRS air data inertial reference systems so this is part of the inertia so there are two parts in an air data inertial reference system one is the air data part we saw some sensors external to the aircraft pitot and static sensors we also have total air temperature sensors we also have angle of attack sensors some of the modern airplanes like 380s 350s 787s they have multi-function devices 
which are putting together these air data sensors together pito static giving you barometric altitude the the um, uh, angle of attack and all together put together these are multi function devices in the traditional planes or the uh, the the fourth generation planes like 320s and 737s they have the uh, individual sensors static and pito sensors they will all give you air data parameters and using the air data we are able to calculate our altitude bearing our um, our speed angle of attack etc now for the identification i put three different uh, pictures here on the left is the identification of the aircraft with regards to the traffic that's also the new uh, i'll say the latest system which we use automatic dependent surveillance broadcast that's the adsb for identification there is also another identification of your position and your threat with regards to the airspace itself that means two different aircrafts you can see you have one aircraft let's say that's our aircraft and an intruder who comes into the airspace then we have also the third preventive measure which is called as the gpws ground proximity warning system and an enhanced ground proximity warning system so let's look at the first one air uh, automatic de dependence surveillance broadcast this is constantly emitting the data the data with regards to your flight path it is also the aircraft identification the aircraft altitude all that so the adsb is using a transponder called mode s s for sera people who are uh, used to uh, used to um, let's say aviation we have three types of transponders transponder a alpha transponder c charlie transponder s sera for the adsb to work with we have the transponder s transponder s is to transmit selective data and flight data so you have a lot of information sent to ground that means to the ground stations air traffic controllers as well as to the other aircraft okay so these automatic dependent surveillance by the word itself it says it's automatic so it's sending data okay sending data by itself then dependent that means it is depending on some information which which is uh, going to be provided and surveillance surveillance is to identify what is happening around you also sending information to the ground so we are sending this data through from the aircraft to satellites but also to the ground station so you you are fully aware where you are and it's not only your awareness uh, uh, your awareness but also um, the awareness to to the others that means the people who are around you or the aircrafts which are around you so that's the automatic dependence surveillance broadcast so that's the first uh, identification we we, would, we are looking at the second identification is the tcas traffic collision avoidance system now you you can see those circle or let's say um elliptical orbits elliptical patterns which are given for the uh, tcas system you have a aircraft which is our aircraft for example then you have an intruder aircraft with a certain amount of let's say um uh, uh, a pattern which is identified to keep to prevent a collision between two aircrafts now you have an intruder coming into your path this
traffic collision avoidance systems works 360 degrees above the aeroplane that means above the aircraft as well as below the aircraft there are two different antennas the antennas which i showed you in the beginning so it can identify 360 degrees around 40 nautical miles and it can identify close to 40 aircrafts around it so as it comes closer and closer you can see it it's initially an intruder but subsequently it becomes advisory and resolution advisory depending on the the distance between two aircrafts so situational awareness with regards to traffic around you the third one which we are going to look at is the ground proximity is again situational awareness but this situational awareness it is with the ground there is a famous term which is extremely scary for pilots and this uh, this term is called as CFIT Charlie Foxtrot India Tango and this is about controlled flight into terrain terrain is mountain but then we also have something called man-made terrain for example if you are flying near Dubai Dubai the famous Burj Khalifa tower is 998 meters from ground so it's as good as a terrain it's as good as a mountain for us so terrain is not just man uh, just natural could also be man-made let's call it as obstacles otherwise so the ground proximity warning system is alerting the pilots from the aircraft altitude which is very proximate to the terrain so we have two parts one is called ground proximity warning the other one is called enhanced ground proximity warning what is the difference between these two the first one looks downwards so the basic model ground proximity warning system is looking downwards to a, from a plane the enhanced ground proximity is just not only that means additional to looking downwards it is also looking forward so it is downwards plus prediction what is in front of you let me give you an example a very uh, interesting example if you all remember what is the altitude of mount everest mount everest is around 10 kilometers altitude 9980 so it's almost 10 kilometers altitude from the mean sea level if you convert that one into feet you can you can see it's around 34000 feet above the ground that actually means if you are flying from delhi to nepal kathmandu or even better even worse i would say is from delhi to bhutan paro international airport you would be flying across these mountains and eight of these mountains which are above 8000 meters from the mean sea level are in that path so if you are flying at 30000 feet uh, barometric altitude you are still not safe you are right going to be bumping into one of these huge mountains so we cannot be looking downwards for mountains because we could be flying into these mountains which are also above your flight path so the enhanced ground proximity warning system is looking forward and giving you predictive terrain awareness so situational awareness we saw three of them ADS-B to identify yourself identify with the other airplanes collision avoidance is not only for yourself but also the other aircrafts they can talk to each other electronically by pulses and they can also predict and advise each other to go into a flight path for example if two of the airplanes are coming into the flight path they detect this traffic one can determine say okay you fly up i fly or descend downwards thereby avoiding a tika situation so that's the second one we talked about and the third one is proximity warning to ground now the next topic we are going to look at is the landing systems now i have just put a 
an example of Bangalore to Delhi although the DPN is a very strange uh, uh, abbreviation given to Delhi Delhi is normally VIDP Victor India Delta Papa that's the IKO code for Delhi now when you're flying from Bangalore to Delhi you are flying in a particular path you cannot fly as you like you have to fly a particular path so this is called a, a flight plan and this flight plan which is just given here these are across waypoints waypoints are just like landmarks on ground waypoints from air but then when we are reaching Delhi for example it could be in the middle of uh, of a winter in Delhi somewhere in, in the uh, late weeks of December and early weeks of January you would enter into a, a very strange situation where you don't see enough the airports so we enter into what we call as LVO low visibility operations when you are having enough visibility it's very easy to fly I would not say easy to fly it's still manageable to fly with visual references but then when you are flying in a low visibility condition it's very very tricky because the pilot has to really decide whether he goes ahead with the landing or he needs to go around so the landing systems are something which are going to help the pilot to decide whether he is in the right track whether he is on the runway and he can decide to land so let's see the, the landing systems so these are the two landing systems which we normally use for LVO that's low visibility operations the low visibility operations we use two external that means those external transmitters are on the ground on the airport they're called the localizer and the glide slope by the name itself they can tell you something glide slope slope has to be inclined so slope guides you on a vertical path and localizer so it's localized so it gives you a horizontal or lateral path so if you can see here the aircraft is when it comes approaching towards an airport it is able to capture these two frequencies which are emitted from these two transmitters or shown here also as well these transmitters these are on the airport that's on the landing track normally called as runways these are emitting those radio signals beacons for vertical guidance and horizontal guidance and capturing this and trying to navigate into the middle of these two beacons you are able to identify the center of the runway and the right glide or right angle to fly towards the touchdown point of the runway in addition to this we also have outer middle and the inner marker the marker are exactly in the path towards the central line of the runway now most of us when you are flying into a, a big airport I would say when I, when I say a big airport could be Hyderabad, could be Chennai, could be Bombay, Mumbai, uh, could be Delhi, could be Bangalore. These airports are extremely busy all the time. So most of us when you are entering into these airports, we, are allow, we, are, we can see there are plenty of uh, resident buildings down below us. But we are not allowed to land. We are circling around. So we can see there is a holding stack or holding path this is primarily to allow a particular in trial procedure to make sure that each one is given us a, a landing space in time segregated by time segregated by vertical as well as horizontal distance so that they have safety and a smooth landing space when they are approaching the airports so the holding stack is normally away from the run, runway or away from the airport in a specific pattern if you go towards 
let, let's say airports like Kolkata or to Chennai, you will see the the holding stacks are primarily over the sea. You are seeing the sea for a very long time, and once it is cleared, they go towards the runway and approach and land. So the landing systems don't don't you worry. All the modern planes they have the capability of operating in in a very safe and very reliable manner using the low visibility operation operating systems that includes ILS ILS is instrument landing system now what is instrument then I have not shown any of instruments on my screen when I say instruments it actually depicts the instruments inside the cockpit so the pilot is not seeing outside or even if he sees outside the visibility conditions are not really conducive for him to see the runway so instruments that means the instruments in the cockpit the the display systems which we saw in the beginning so instrument landing system this is what he relies on and the instruments capture this data which we are seeing these transmitters which are uh, emitting these radio signals they are captured calculated and shown on these displays that's why i was talking continuously about the center avionic center is the cockpit where you see all these uh, information in the display units now flight management flight management is extremely uh, i would say innovative extremely interesting but then highly imaginative when I say imaginative, it's a dream world. You have to really dream with me. A flight management computer has its database inside. What database? Database of all the airports, all the waypoints, the flight routes, the navigation systems, etc. etc. So it has it's one of the most important computers on the airplane. Now with the flight management system, the pilot is entering the origin data, the destination data, how he would fly what speed what direction how he is going to increase its uh, its altitude etc etc all that through the flight management computer and using its database it will calculate all the information now i'm sure most of you who have traveled in an airplane you also hear sometimes a pilot says we are 12 minutes from landing how does he know how can he predict is he an astrologer no, the flight management system actually calculates the destination time, the time to destination. When I say time, destination time, it's a long term prediction and time to destination is exactly accurately predicted data based on its position. Now, auto flight system, if you really think about an, a car versus a plane, a car the car you need to be on the steering wheel all the time or, or you, you have to be on the accelerator all the time that means if you are driving your car for five hours you need to be holding the steering wheel all five hours and the acceleration on your on your foot for five hours but that's a, that, that doesn't happen on an airplane because the thrust of an engine the direction the speed of an air, aircraft is completely controlled by what we call as auto flight system with the inputs coming from your inertial system that means gyros accelerometers navigation all that and the system is constantly recalculating its position and guiding the aircraft now while it does this auto flight it also needs to look at what is the best possible way of flying you cannot have too high angle of attack or too low angle of attack you cannot fly with very less speed or very high speed so an envelope protection is very very important that takes again inputs from inertial system air data system navigation so plenty of input so the flight management system cannot work without the out of flight flight envelope all put together is the flight management system so it's preventive corrective and the flight management deals with all of that in real time and then finally when it does all these three functions it also sends this information back to the cockpit why does it have to do that as simple as that if everything is automatic 
the pilot wouldn't know if he doesn't have a feedback if he doesn't have the information so the cockpit indication the cockpit interface gives you a real-time information about where you are how you are flying what is the uh, expected uh, the flight path all that information and another important aspect is the pilot is the boss in the airplane so if he has to disconnect if the system doesn't behave well the pilot can complete take the complete control of the aircraft from the aircraft system that means auto flight all right but then the pilot is still able to monitor super supervise and take control whenever it's required now having said the manned flying we are going into an unmanned flying this is the latest bus everybody looks at the skies these days to look at what we can do with unmanned flying unmanned flying it was primarily it started in the 1990s although the military drones were existing from a very very long time if you if you ask me the the origin the history of drones it started way back in the 18th century the late 18th century that was primarily a hot air balloon with ex, uh, with fully loaded with explosives and sent into the enemy territory so that is how it started but then it was not really controlled flying it was an unmanned uncontrolled flying so it was primarily the military thing which was there but then when we started the commercial civil flying manned uh, sorry unmanned and uncontrolled drones it was somewhere in the late 1990s then started with the 2000 where we started using the drones for dull dirty repetitive and dangerous operations dull dirty you can see the picture there it's to inspect a mobile tower D dangerous because it's very high it's repetitive so they didn't want to do it by by the humans so they tried it there but then now it's not really the truth we are using for plenty of operations and the drone has a mainframe that's the hardware part the transmission which is the wireless part the propulsion which is the propellers the blades the flight controllers which we talked in the manned aviation as flight management here we call it as flight controllers and all these put together as primary uh, requirements but then we also had optional things payload most of it was the camera the video cameras and the or, uh, or, the, or the normal cameras but now it's not restricted to that the categories were simple the four categories were nanos just toys i would say small ones up to 20 kilograms category then the medium ones then the large ones large ones are today most of it are for military purposes military applications but the small ones are really a lot more you must have seen during the covid operations people used for surveillance they use it for law enforcements you, you must have seen a lot of videos on the whatsapp uh, people have used for locust operations the small insects which were infesting a lot of agricultural uh, um, uh, purposes they are destroying the crops so locust operations in rajasthan in delhi in some part of gurgaon all these places small drones were used for spraying pesticides and then medium and large drones are primarily now used still used in military operations a very uh, interesting enterprising small machines i would say these drones they have different platforms the platforms are four multi rotor these are the most used ones i would say then fixed wing drones fixed wing drones are primarily like aircrafts fixed wings with with uh, uh, propellers single rotor operations and fixed wing hybrid ones so fixed wing hybrid ones are a combination of multi and fixed wing drones both put together this is the latest one the fixed wing hybrid ones which is capable of vertical takeoff and landing which is only possible otherwise by multi rotor drones fixed wing drones 
need a catapult or a landing under take off space and single loader helicopters are a complicated machine basically it requires very good training it's not so easy so fixed wing hybrid ones are the ones which are taking the mark the industry by storm it's small sizes now culture railways mine detection photo reconnaissance satellite missions weaponry medical supplies uh, law enforcement disaster management in many places actually even now as we are speaking there are many drone operations which have uh, taken place in landslide in kerala in uh, uh, in other places even with the accidents which happened in uh, happened in the aviation industry they have used the drone operation to identify uh, any survivors so you have plenty of user cases this is why it's very very enterprising this is one of the major things which is going to take the aviation industry by storm very very soon it's already doing it it will be very very soon when uh, drones are everywhere now going on from what is present to what is known as uh, a little known tomorrow i i'm sure all of you have seen a, a lot of videos in the youtube you have plenty of air taxis coming in air taxis from airbus from boeing from volocopter from uber so these are the ones which are electrically driven vertical takeoff and landing capable air taxis capable of holding four people six people you can see there are six of them many of them are unmanned some of them are self driven it's like a really a uber one which can be also with a pilot with a driver in other words a pilot and this is the future which is coming very very fast these two uh, these three uh, which you can see the boeing the airbus and the volocopter they are already flying they are accumulating test flying they are sh uh, uh, showing endurance they are showing flight test safety and all that so in the next one or two years you will see that these are the ones which are flying possibly uh, making the the last end connectivity or the first end connectivity to the airports so i would i i'm foreseeing that the next 20 kilometers that means from the airport to your houses 20 kilometers 25 kilometers or maximum of 40 kilometers or from your house to the airport 25 to 40 kilometers these are the ones which are going to take the industry by storm so this is the little known tomorrow i would say but little known actually so uh, before i go in i i would i would say these are uh, uh, the new one which is coming up the autonomous taxi take off and landing uh, aircraft an airbus aircraft now this is on the test you can see the pilot is just keeping his hand on it he is not moving any of that so it's going to be completely autonomous take off and landing so the pilot is just monitoring it and supervising it he is not using his controls he is not doing it by himself it's by the system so it's a little well known tomorrow okay so that actually is our little well known tomorrow this is already in place so the future of flying is unfolding for us so people who have asked me a few questions on whether we would have tomorrow an aircraft without a pilot possibly yes but when that's the question that's really the question as we build data which makes us more and more reliant more and more safe with pilots without pilots we will see these autonomous take off landing capable aircrafts coming to the market market completely fly by wire so fly by wire is already existing since several years more than 3 decades now this is going to really take this take our aviation industry by storm uh there are two videos i wouldn't write, really go into too many videos i would say let's go into uh, our our uh, other slides 
to look at uh, some avionics at the future. Avionics future, we have made our aircrafts extremely safe. Really, it's extremely safe. The uh, if you look at, I know many of us are listening to accidents across the world, but believe me, they are one into several millions. That means one in several millions. Although the the uh, the rates actually result in some fatalities, I extremely empathize with that. But then the aircraft themselves are extremely safe. Now looking at the future of avionics, one thing is engine hybridization. That means we are looking at engine hybrids. That means it will be a thermal engine, a, a typical turbofan with an electrically assisted motor. So increasing a lot of performance efficiency but reducing the fuel footprint. That means the carbon footprint. We are also looking at enhanced flight vision systems which will allow the pilots to fly safe synthetic vision infrared that means we are going to be really the pilots are going to be really uh, uh, helped supported by very good vision systems with a lot of sensors inputs coming from avionics again so this is avionics part enhanced flight vision systems now the the second buzzword is the internet of things plenty of sensors across the aircrafts these smart sensors will collect data and send into the uh, to the cockpit but not just the cockpit but also to the ground making it more efficient in flying making it more downtime that means it can fly faster from the airport to its destinations it will also give a lot of data about what are the possible problems or pro malfunctions or failures which can be detectable and avoid it before it happens. So preventive maintenance. The next subject which we can also look at avionics in the future is predictive maintenance. Today predictive maintenance is much much limited and taking data analytics data analytics we can identify when the systems are you know it's it's a kind of identifying before not with corrective maintenance but preventive maintenance to avoid interruptions to avoid higher costs because of uh, replacements it can actually good uh, give a very good insight for root ca root cause analysis of problems and fixing problems in the longer run this is really the sensors the data collected from the sensors while the aircraft is flying i said reduce downtime that means the aircraft is still flying and while it is flying the aircraft connectivity allows us to gather gather this data and analyze it to reduce operational costs so that's the avionics which uh, we are looking at we are looking at safe flying but we are also looking at efficient flying efficient maintenance thereby reducing costs so it's really really efficiency at a very high rate now learning from nature we are seeing birds from centuries now birds like albatross birds like hawk the sharks uh, in the uh, in the sea they are extremely agile extremely efficient you can see an albatross flying for more than two three hours without even flapping a wing without even flapping a feather we are trying to learn from them we are trying to learn and adapt our efficient machines to reduce the carbon footprint and have a very very little impact on environment around us and you can see these these machines are now getting these are airbus projects which are going to come in the next few years and you'll see that the carbon footprint is much much reduced and this will allow you see this is one of the aircraft which is already being you with a model aircraft they are flying to identify and to analyze the, the data
so this this is taking up from nature and uh, we are trying to analyze how we can fly so this is a completely different model of what we have as aircraft today so we have the pins from the shafts to increase the efficiency the flapping wings to identify how we can use this flapping or not flapping to in increase our efficiency of flight so inspired by nature although it's a bit late to learn from nature but it's never late i would say we are learning from the eagles the sharks the owls the albatross and this is called the biomimicry and all these gentlemen who are listening the ladies and the gentlemen who are listening from uh, to me coming from the aeronautical background you have uh, ideas to mimic the the birds the the animals the all the nocturnal ones the best kept secrets of nature don't really keep your ideas within yourself send it to us send it to the aviation specialist we will try to see how we can Im uh, improve and make our uh, our aviation more efficient so this is what i would like you all to do inspire yourself because what is impossible today is the future tomorrow out of the box thinking or inside the box simple thinking what is simple is what is inspiring tomorrow what is crazy today is the tomorrow what is silly today could be the tomorrow so bring in all your ideas don't keep it your, with yourself don't think it's silly if they had thought it was silly to have an apple falling from a tea tree we wouldn't have all these formulas all these philosophies now so it's very important for you to put in all your ideas into the tomorrow which we are going to come with now let's look at the scenario what we would we might have tomorrow with so many air taxis drones aircrafts coming in this is something which we can foresee we can have a circular aerodromes circular taxis takes circular runways we could also have aircrafts flying as air traffic control pods this is possibly this future now the drones this is something which you can look forward you have a drone just like google doing for you you type something and after some time you have google giving you an idea this could be amazon prime just a, a concept i see you have guess are you willing to buy our curtains that could be tomorrow the artificial intelligence of drones they might fly capture the data and give you what you require you might also have the personal air transports you might have autonomous flights you might have disaster management autonomous taking the fire retardants fire extinguishers you could also have multiple longer beyond visual line of sight uh, equipment we could have anti drones as well so more drones anti drones that's the future from the drones as well so the future is really really ins uh, enterprising and inspiring the jigs of pieces of future for the drones you can see drone swarms tomorrow bollywood industry might come the dancing with the drones you never know we have we would have the amazons having the beehive philosophies they are already experimenting with that we could have drones coming into endless space inside pipes inside uh, inside your buildings so that's with special missions armed missions you could have plenty of that jigsaw pieces coming in the future that's the drone which is going to come it's coming very fast believe me this is the jigsaw which we need to fill and solve and that with that i i would like to thank all of you for hearing me around an hour and i have a few questions which are uh, which are sent to me about a few things uh, uh, i would say i'm just picking up a few of them 
Tribe's new avionic systems, I think we talked about a few avionic systems. Some of them are being experimented and uh, experiments doesn't mean that you will always have. This question is from, uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Sudhir Kumar. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Kumar, not every experiment we do is going to be successful. It's always going to be tested, experimented and really checked for its safety, reliability and redundancy. Uh, another one which I'm going to uh, pick up is what is, um, you know, cyber security. I, I don't know if it's related to aviation. Don't really worry. Cyber security, uh, at least at le until now, there are many aircrafts which are being tested for autonomous flights. Uh, I'm, I really mean the autonomous takeoff and landing uh, aircrafts, which you just saw on the video, they cannot be hacked. At least today, they cannot be hacked, except and until you have uh, somebody who is extremely genius trying to hack uh, an aircraft. Today, the answer is no. At least for the next five years, you can keep uh, thinking about uh, trying to hack an aircraft. Until five years, we will also make the aircraft systems robust enough so that you cannot enter or penetrate inside. Um, okay. Um, management of multiple systems. Yeah, it's really, really uh, multiple systems are being managed. Now we are looking at uh, uh, systems called integrated modular avionics and working on ethernets with switches and, and uh, very, very fast ethernet systems. Basically, they are able to capture, they're going to work extremely fast and control, monitor, interface with multiple systems in one go. So they're very, very efficient systems. So yes, multiple systems. Uh, I'm not really uh, going to names who have asked. Uh, I'm going to uh, look at... Uh, okay, as a programmer, can you explain the roles we can do in the field of drones? That's based on your imagination, uh, guys. There are hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, systems um, which are, as I told you, 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 your imagination is your destiny. So you can, you can really uh, do what you want and you can program the drones based on the IoT, Internet of Things. You can put a lot of sensors on it. I have seen drones which are used for detect mining mines not the uh, i mean the mines on the battlefield i have seen drones which can identify with ct scanners uh, a crack on a surface of uh, of a building so your imagination is, is your destiny so really need your imagination as i told you nothing is silly nothing is crazy everything is possible um, okay i'm going to Okay, this is okay. Um, I, I would take another question from traffic management. Um, traffic management, we are uh, looking at a lot of uh, um, integration. Today, we have, as I discussed, we have two different uh, integrations. One is about uh, unmanned space, and the other one is manned space, the manned aircraft, pilot driven, and the unmanned space. There are two different spaces and integration with regards to even a hot air balloon could be, could be uh, a drone, could be helicopters. So we are looking at UTM, Unified Traffic Management, Unmanned Traffic Management, all put together. We are looking at it, Airbus and Boeing, they are all working together. So uh, at some point of time, we will... I think uh, so. We are looking uh, lo looking together to uh, to put all of these things together, and in a short while from now, we will have these systems. Let's say three to five years, we should have all this unmanned traffic management system. Thank you very much for for the time, and uh, I hand over to uh, the administrator now. Thank you.